Um, well, yeah. This is a little bit different for me because I'm used to having, as a barrister, a lectern in front of me protecting me from the judge <laughs> and having something to hide behind. I, I feel a little bit exposed, but I have to say, this is probably as close as I would come to doing a gig in a basement in West End. <laughs> you know, so, 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 so that, that said, um, that's our topic. And I, I have really um, worked to the uh, points that were raised in the flyer. I don't know if you had an opportunity to, to see that. Um, I don't have a problem that I don't have something to do with my hands because having a Greek background, they are waving around all the time. So I don't have, I have to put them in my pockets at all. Slide, please. Okay. Now, uh, this slide deals with my journey. I'll, before that, I'll just mention briefly. I actually had a slide for this, but I thought uh, the topic is not about me. But. I am a graduate from Sydney University. I'm born and bred Sydney. Uh, I graduated and opened up a practice in um, Kingsford, which is a Sydney in a eastern suburb. Su uh, suburb. And um, I had a practice going single. I think by 26 or 27, I owned about three Surrey Hills houses, those terrace houses. I played rugby for Randwick. I was a lifesaver with Maroubra and one would think that everything is going swimmingly, but it wasn't cutting it. I ran into a chap who was a very, he was the captain of the New South Wales schoolboys team, um, which we played as, a, I don't know if you remember the Springboks, there was quite a lot of demonstrations we played at that. He was a very tough guy and he had a conversion. He accepted Christ and I was just shocked um, because I had associated um, Christians at school with people who couldn't play football or people who didn't do that. So that, that's a stereotypical, I'm, I'm ashamed to say it, but that was my view. But when he said it, it, it made an impression. Um, I accepted Christ on the 1st of April 1979 and shortly after um, Billy Graham came and uh, the Randwick race course and went forward. Um, I uh, practiced uh, in a place called Gosford at about an hour and a half north of Sydney. For about 16 years, my practice involved, I was acting for the largest developer in Australia, Hooker Homes at that stage. I was just cutting up land and, and subdividing and doing all that. I did that for about 15, 16 years and I thought there has to be more to it. Sold my practice and took my family to Victoria and went to the Bible College of Victoria and um, uh, did a Bachelor of Theology. At the end of that, my brother, also a solicitor, offered me a position in Sydney and a chap from Brisbane, a chap by the name of John Kenny, offered me intellectual property, copyright, patents, design. So I took that and I got into intellectual property. I was with John for about four years and then I went to the bar. I've always had a writing submissions, government submissions, and uh, I've been involved uh, with, um, with uh, Indigenous Australians, Indigenous um, uh, peoples for a long time insofar as I'll come to it that um, I uh, had a brief with a senior counsel, um, uh, which he was a in-house counsel for the secretariat of the old ATSIC. So I was there and I, I saw a lot of things that uh, shaped my view. Okay. Now, uh, back one. Okay, uh, my contact. Attic and Nails, uh, Mr. Vasta was his name, QC, a former Supreme Court judge, uh, and I uh, uh, were fighting the Brisbane City Council in respect of patented water meters, which you all have in front of your house. The inventors um, were unjustly robbed of their patent because they inadvertently put the patent in one name instead of two. I remedied that and changed the law uh, when I did my doctoral thesis so that injustice was the first. But I actually took up residence inside the secretariat for ASIC and all of the um, things were going on around and I was hearing all the things uh, regarding uh, funds being misapplied and um, in 2004 ASIC ended. Uh, I've done pro bono work uh, for the arts law and artists in black. 
bound by confidentiality on some things, but I have, uh, I've been briefed by the state government and I've opposed the state government. Uh, I've opposed the state government in respect of um, indigenous artists who um, were literally ripped off of their artwork and uh, uh, couldn't afford to get legal advice and legal counsel. I normally always insist on having a solicitor, but with those, those kind of briefs, I directly um, uh, deal with the artist and um, we have always got a good resolution. Um, it would shock you to think that, that a representative, an indigenous representative of the government offered for the artwork that my client did a bottle of bourbon. Now, uh, that is just, where are we? we we're exchanging beads for, for things like that. So uh, I really took it very personally that, that this is just so unfair. And it was, was, was through an Indigenous representative of the state government, a liaison. So I, um, I, I had the privilege of being able to intervene and apply um, my, um, my intellectual property knowledge there. I was given a, a copyright agency is the largest collecting agency of royalties for artists and writers uh, in Australia. And um, uh, they awarded me a research grant to look at um, ways that uh, Indigenous um, cultural knowledge, literary works, artistic works could be protected. And uh, in that research, although it was published in 2017, I had a lot to do with elders and, and um, uh, finding out uh, exactly what they wanted, what, uh, um, what uh, aspects of the law were letting them down. And uh, there were pluses and minuses. For example, uh, I have successfully prosecuted uh, cases for copyright owners, as that one with the council, uh, with the, um, sorry, state government, but um, there are shortcomings. One story of a, um, uh, in Darwin at a school, the wife of the headmaster uh, sat with some elder women and she was taking down notes. Well, she published those notes of the story of Dreamtime in a book. Copyright doesn't protect the story as being told. It protects the expression. And as that, that woman was taking down the notes, the elders didn't realise that they were giving up the rights. And the rights vested in that, that, um, that headmaster's um, wife. So the other things that are shortcomings with our, our law is that a lot of their um, uh, works, they can't name an author. The ones that I have an author now that said I drew this as that one that was against the state government, I have no problem. The law will support them, the law will take them and protect their intellectual property and their copyright. However, if they're reproducing something that they can't even name the author, the law will let them down. The law lets them down in so far as the law doesn't recognise a community title. They say, well, this isn't, this isn't just mine, this is my clan, this is my community. I'm a, one of a number of custodians for it. The law doesn't recognise that. It recognises the person who puts pen to paper, basically in, 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 that, in that way. So there were shortcomings and I made a suggestion to correct the issue and that was to have a, a board of um, a quite fluid board in terms of having elders relevant to the artistic work advise the Intellectual Property Office, IP Australia, on, on whether that's a misuse or whether it's authorised to be done. Um, okay, now, the, there's going to be a theme that... I have not given the, the um, voice a lot of thought until I uh, drew my attention because of this paper. I didn't ignore it, but... I'd, I'd heard the West End coffee shop discussions from people who subscribe to Financial Review, so I thought, for the moment, that's good enough. Um, and their, um, their view was that the third element, and we'll get to that, was not crystallised enough. Uh, there was no direction or there was no um, proper structure to 
the way the government, whether it be obliged to follow the recommendations or the suggestions of the voice. Something, oh, that's right. That's not the first time that's happened. But <laughs> I will, I'll try to keep that in mind. Um, the flag, for example, and this is the theme that I'm, I'm going to, has, has shaped a little bit of where I think I'm going on, on the voice. And that is my um, experience uh, is that, well, take the, the flag. The flag was founded in dispute. The, uh, there was a proclamation, I think it was of 1995, that said that the um, Aboriginal, the Australian Aboriginal flag and the Torres Islands Torres Strait uh, flag will be now um, subject to licences given by the Governor General. The eventual author um, of the, um, uh, of the uh, flag uh, made an application to the tribunal since the government has taken it the government can take all our intellectual property. You can invent anything you like, you can write anything you like. They can take anything, but it's subject to an obligation to remunerate the inventor, the designer, the author, the artist, etc. So um, uh, the matter was taken to the tribunal to have the government pay for now this proclamation um, and the use of get royalties. Unfortunately, three people turned up and said that we were the original authors. The original author uh, a, um, uh, and two others, Mr Tennant and the Mr Brown. And um, the judge, who was a presiding judge over the tribunal, said, look, we don't have the authority. We have the authority to, to deal between the government and the owner, but we don't have the authority to do determine who's the owner. So he sent them off to the federal court and eventually the, um, the owner was identified. Now, uh, that owner never went back to get the remuneration done and it slept dormant and this was a criticism. It was authored in 1971 and it wasn't until the proclamation in 1995 that the author came, came forward. Now, <clears throat> uh, the events more recently, uh, I think you may have known or heard of those, where um, a, a uh, exclusive licence was given worldwide to a company, uh, I've acronymed it WAM, its name is WAM, I think Proprietary Limited, and they were given exclusive rights for the use of the flag. Now, um, the difficulty was that Wham started writing to people like the AFL and saying, you can't use this, we have an exclusive licence. <clears throat> so that created a lot of um, anxiety, particularly with clothing companies, uh, with um, First Nation owners of those businesses. You know, what can we do with the flag? So there was all this chaos happening around uh, 2000 and end of 2019. So the government asked for opinions. I gave an opinion and my view was um, that, that yes, for before the proclamation, the government used it, you know, reproduced it, which is one of the rights of the owner, and they have to pay for it. So, um, uh, the, um, I've actually forgotten his name for the moment, the original author of it, I should know it, I've said it a lot of times, but the author, uh, was entitled to negotiate for that period prior to the proclamation. My submission said that once the proclamation was made and you had to get licences from the Governor-General, the government owned it. And under the Constitution, I don't know if you can remember the, the castle, that movie, The Castle, on just terms. Is that a reminder to do something? OK, OK, I did those sort of... I asked for five-minute knocks if it's so. <laughs> so, so uh, on just terms. So I said, up to the proclamation, yes, negotiate on a licence, a royalty fee, but after that, the government owns it. Well, I, um, uh, there was a, in the report, there was a reference to my submission. They said, oh, no, the proclamation doesn't act like that. There was nothing to support that position. And so my attempt to be funny, next slide, thanks. I wrote to them and said, you haven't given me an explanation. Uh, I did a bit of research on that. It turns out that cartoonists introduced the phrase, an awkward silence, uh, 
I can hear crickets. Well, that's what I heard. I didn't hear anything from the government um, to say... Next slide, thanks. Uh, to say that, look, you've got a point here. They had no explanation in my language. I said... I, I spelled it out very clearly. Here's in the Act. Uh, one of the rights that an owner has under the Act is... Oh, Mr Thomas, yes. One of the rights is to reproduce a work. If you... Um, if you did uh, an artistic work, and it doesn't have to be a fantastic artistic work, uh, you have guaranteed the right to reproduce that work or allow your authorised representative to reproduce it for you. In other words, you might, might be successful and you get a printer to make limited edition copies. So the, the history of the authorship of the flag was in contest. And... Um, Forgive me if it appears that I am spending a lot of time on, on the flag, which I'm not going to do much longer, but I've, I've come to a conclusion that's relevant to the changes that are in the um, amending bill, that whilst there may be a voice which there's a discretion, as we'll see, to make recommendations, they don't have to make recommendations, but when there's a discretion to make recommendations, um, in my experience, that voice is unlikely to be a united voice. So, um, query, what's the status of a recommendation that doesn't have the full support of the body that's set up? Um, Certainly, I don't see any obligation on the government to accept it, but I, I think it doesn't even get to first base unless it has a consensus of the members of the voice, the board, whoever is appointed. Uh, I'd mentioned that, that uh, Mr Thomas hadn't uh, taken any steps and that the judge was eventually... Even though he found that he was the original author, was critical of, of that. It was the, the proclamation that was the catalyst of Mr Thomas coming forward. So um, he, it was said in the, in the transcript of the court case he was upset by the Governor-General because he saw that as a resumption, if you like, using you know, land uh, resumption of his rights. But copyright is a personal property and it can be assigned, it can be handed down in a will and it's so when the Governor-General all of a sudden has put himself to be in the position where he decides who gets a licence under the Flags Act, the amendment to the Flags Act, uh, then uh, Mr, um, Mr Thomas saw red. Now, the barrister, uh, who's a senior counsel, wasn't then, but at the time, uh, is a, a good friend of mine from Melbourne. I haven't discussed my submission with him because it's just not appropriate to do that. He's, he was going into negotiations now with the government um, on this, this events that happened because of this private company, not Indigenous, which made um, the um, Aboriginal community up in arms, um, had assumed the rights to the most important feature of their cultural knowledge. The, 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 the one representation that, that speaks for all of them that says, this is us, that was given to a non-Indigenous um, company. And, and it, it gets a little bit worse than that. Um, these are reading glasses, by the way. That's why I'm squinting to see what that is. I mean, you can do this if you want. Where do I find the order of the barrister? Thomas Chambers is the owner. Yes, all right. Never returned to the tribunal. Slide, thanks. OK. Gave it to Wham. Sorry, gave it to Wham in uh, November 2018. Uh, Wham sent cease and desist letters. Uh, my, um, uh, in my submission, I said that the cease and desist letters uh, that Wham sent uh, were of no use. They, they were groundless. Uh, intellectual property, unlike a debt, if I owe you money and I threaten you, you can't really do anything about me except not pay. But intellectual property has the peculiarity that if you threaten someone that you have a certain right, as Wham did, I could take you to court saying your threat to me was unjustified or groundless. So in my submission I said this is groundless because when the proclamation took the title to the copyright into the government, Mr Thomas didn't have anything to give away and it's a, it's a 
my mother will be disappointed. She may be do four years of Latin, so I could do law, but I can't remember the, the, the Latin equivalent. But it is you can't give what you don't have. You can't sell what you don't have. So Mr Thomas didn't have the right, in my submission, to, um, to uh, offer WAM a licence. Now, WAM, the company, had a director. That director was also a director of a company called Barubi, which had been found guilty of, of counterfeit indigenous works. 18,000 boomerangs, those bull roarers, didgeridoos, over two and a half years. And the company was fined 2.3 million. The director of that company was the one that Mr Thomas gave a licence to for the flag. Unbelievable. Anyway. Verubi went into liquidation, didn't pay a cent. Next slide, thank you, Paul. Right, now, um, you'll bear with me. This is, this is trying to make the Copyright Act as user-friendly, but it, you, you should get a, an understanding of this. That is, the, own, the owner of the copyright in anything is usually, at first base, the author, the artist, but it can change, oh, that, that's helpful, thank you. But it can change uh, if you're working for someone and you're employed as an architect drawing plans, you're doing it for your boss, but I won't need to go into that. Relevantly for this is that as the owner of copyright, you're given certain rights. You've got the right to reproduce it. I've put there communicate, send it by email, uh, publish it. That, those are rights that are guaranteed by you, and you're also given the right to give it to somebody else to do, to license someone to do that. I infringe someone's copyright if I reproduce it, for example, without their license, without their permission. That seems pretty f basic. So by the proclamation giving the general, the governor general, the right to license, in law, not just Mr. Thomas's perceptions, in law a very fundamental right of the owner was taken away from Mr Thomas and hence his application for remuneration. Now, um, my submissions were, as I've said, the proclamation um, changed the whole thing. Uh, there was no explanation um, for, uh, from the Senate committee that looked at this question that was raised a couple of years ago uh, by this company and no acknowledgement of the submission I made but my end point was that you have to pay for this. The government paid $20 million for it. Now, I haven't imposed on my friend to ask how that $20 million was divided up, uh, because I certainly would, would um, stick in my throat if the Barubi director actually got any of that money. Um, so, <coughs> that's probably um, defamatory, but um, uh, defence to defamation is truth. So I'm repeating things that were in the judgment of Justice Melissa Perry from South Australia. Next slide, thanks, Paul. Now, um, uh, this is a heading... Oh, I thought this was sort of clever. Uh, ABC News article. Uh, the Commonwealth bought the Aboriginal. Has it freed or colonised? Now... Um, the statement was made, all Australians can now put the Aboriginal flag. There's no restriction on it now. There's no copyright in terms... The copyright is owned by the government. The government says you can use it. You just have to use it respectfully. If you look into it a bit more, I found that, that you shouldn't be using it at night you, unless you've got a light on it. You shouldn't be putting it up in the rain. These are all little sidekicks of the Flags Act. I thought, oh, that's fantastic. Um, so um, people can use it freely uh, because of that. Now, this particular um, uh, Indigenous uh, Greens senator made a point of saying when the government was considering the submissions that were made as a result of that wham um, usurping or taking the exclusive licence, um, she said what was put to the government as well was that the flag be given back to um, the, um, uh, the Aboriginal people. And the, they, uh, they put up a custodian model that they would look after it. But the government, um, I, I was a little bit more, uh, I, I didn't quite put everything she put in, but she, she was obviously had to walk the fence. 
But, but she, the message she was saying is that that was just put to one side, that wasn't even considered to, to allow the Aboriginal people to um, uh, dictate how and when it was going to be used. So um, I, I think at that point I might just mention that um, if you look at the explanatory statements and even the amendments to the Flags Act, it's called the Australian Aboriginal flag. Now, I, I can tell you that that is offensive to some, to a lot of Indigenous people. And um, uh, one of the things that I found in, in my interviews with many of them is that there was no consensus as to how they'd be called. In my notes, I've purposely called them Indigenous, I've called them First Nations, I've called them Aboriginal. That's because I've heard and interviewed elders who say, I don't like the other two, I like Aboriginal. I don't like First Nations, I, I, I like Aboriginal, I don't like uh, Indigenous. And there was a, there was a, there's no consensus on that, which is just another... I'm not... I'm, I, I, there's no consensus between non-Indigenous people, but on an issue where now they're forming a voice that's going to be um, representing a wider voice of the um, Indigenous... Uh, uh, Australians uh, or Indigenous people that, that live in Australia, um, they, they will, there's a difficulty there that I can perceive. Uh, thank you, Paul. Now, um, I haven't done a lot on this. The question was put in the, in the flyer. The question is, why was the Constitution set up in the way that it was? And I'm, I'm sorry if that's hard to read, but this is the... Um, this is the pre-referendum uh, uh, position of the Constitution. And relevantly, it says that the Parliament shall subject to the Constitution have power to make laws for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth with respect to the people of any race other than the Aboriginal race in any state. And then, that's my underline, because... Um, uh, the referendum removed that particular thing I've underlined, that exclusion. Uh, section 127, Aborigines is not to be counted in reckoning the population. So um, those were the two things that were by 90% majority removed from the Constitution. Thank you, Paul. Now, this is... Um, I've only gone to one source, but it is an authoritative source, a Human Rights Commission. The reason it was given was that the Constitution was drafted at a time when Australia was considered a land that belonged to no one before the European settlement and when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were considered to be a dying community, a dying race, and not worthy of citizenship or humanity. It, it, it's... It's quite incredible that it, it took up to 1967 to remove that, but that seems to me to be... Uh, I've read other, other um, uh, authorities and they all point to this, that there was a lack of respect, a lack of acknowledgement of, of um, Aboriginal peoples um, at that time of 1901, the, the um, formation of the Constitution and the Federation. So uh, that, um, that disrespect or lack of acknowledgement is almost um, an acceptance that they're saying, well, you are not human and you are, you're being extinguished anyway. Um, I, uh, when I um, was writing the paper, I did one year uh, go with my wife to the Moyle Creek where there was a, a massacre. Uh, and those um, um, Aboriginal people were allowed by the station manager to be on the property, but um, uh, convict and some colonists, uh, while the men were, were out hunting, and, and not only hunting but helping, there was a quid pro quo about helping on the, on the uh, cattle station. Um, they, they just took off 28... There were 28 bodies found. There were more than that, but they were just slaughtered. Now, that was an important because... From that incident, and there must be many more of those, but from that incident, seven, seven colonists were executed. That's the first time that that had happened for that, that situation. So um, that, that Moyle Creek massacre uh, had huge implications. Now, uh, sometimes it's said that the referendum in 1967 
um, granted citizenship and the right to vote, but the right to vote came in uh, in an electoral act in 1962 and Queensland adopted that, was the last one to give that, um, that power to vote. Wasn't compulsory, they didn't have to vote, but gave it to them in 1965. Thank you, Paul. Changes that have occurred. Now, um, I, I couldn't find anything other than the 1967 referendum, which carried with a 90% support, uh, and one single post-war reconstruction and democratic rights referendum in 1944, which didn't carry. That was to give the Commonwealth power for a period of five years to legislate for the, uh, on 14 specific matters, but was the rehabilitation of, of um, uh, people who had gone to war, men and women, and the people of the Aboriginal race because they went to war. Men and women served um, in, in, in uh, World War II and uh, uh, they were, um, that was to assist them to get back into the community, give them uh, funds. That referendum didn't carry. Um, there were writings in 2018, I found, of a proposed referendum called Recognise What, the Recognise What movement. Um, this, um, this if, if you read this, or well, I'll read it for you, but this sounds a lot like the voice. This required an acknowledgement in a preamble to the Constitution of the historical fact that Aborigines occupied the continent known as Australia, now known as Australia, prior to its occupation by the British and later peoples of the world. So that would have been an amendment to the preamble. I think that that wouldn't I'm not that I'm thinking the voice is invasive, but it was less invasive, and it's a fair enough acknowledgement because it's a fact. Thank you, Paul. Right. Now, um, this is the constitutional background of the vote uh, this year of the referendum and how the voice will work in the future, uh, and it will change over time uh, by possible future acts of parliament, uh, history of the former ATSIC, and what can be learned from it. Okay, that's the, the name of the bill that will become the, um, the act if and when passed and um, uh, subject to the referendum, of course, but that's what's proposed. And uh, thank you, next slide. Okay, um, this is the, uh, it's an addition of a new chapter and a new provision. And this is the provision that's proposed. Now, um, so it's in recognition of, of the Aboriginal and Torres Island, Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia. There'll be a body called the Voice. The Aboriginal and uh, Torres Strait Islander Voice may, that's my underline, not in the draft um, bill, may make representations to Parliament. I've underlined that because whenever you see may, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. I'm an intellectual property lawyer. But, um, <coughs> as Graham would know over there, we're often called to do st statutory interpretation. So um, it's a rule of statutory interpretation that when you see May, there's a discretion. So the voice will have a discretion to make representations. It's not obliged to make representations, is another way of putting it to Parliament and the Executive um, Government on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So that's my emphasis. So th that's important because of what I was saying. If there's no consensus in the voice, well, it can hardly make a representation um, to Parliament unless it's a splintered representation. Um, and then the Parliament shall subject to have power to make laws with respect to. Now, if you look at the um, Constitution and you go to Section 51, which is what powers um, they have, uh, the Parliament has, one would say, well, why didn't they put, why didn't they put number three, power to make laws, in with all the powers to make laws and then create the, the voice as a separate thing? Um, I, to me, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's probably better to be in one locale. And, and, uh, but the point I, I um, take away from that, now that I've finally read it and not relied on um, 
on uh, uh, solicitors who have coffee in West End and getting it second and third hand. See, that was, the, that was without going over there, it was number three that um, the criticism came that there was no articulation of what the voice, what government can do. Can they keep making laws um, uh, without having it articulated how they're going to make the law, what laws are they going to make? In my naivety and not having done my own reading, I thought, well, that seems like a plausible thing. When I get to read that number three, I'll, I'll make a conclusion. Thanks, Paul. Right. Now, I digress, and I don't know that I want to spend too much time on it. ATSIC lasted um, from 1990 to 2005. Um, there was... Um, it, it had the role, similar to the voice of advising government, on the concerns and the interests of um, Australia's uh, First Nation people. And as you see in the third dot point, at six functions were to advise governments at all levels, provide um, uh, peak national and international uh, advocacy for Australian Indigenous affairs and deliver and monitor Indigenous programs and services. Um, by 2001, um, there seemed to be uh, still on board, $60 million funding over a four year period was renewed. Uh, my personal experience was sitting in the office of the, the in-house council for ATSIC, um, the acronym NAILS, I can't exactly remember what it was all for, but uh, I was there, I was not part of the organisation, but I had heard many things about concerns about uh, where the funds were going in certain instances. Uh, and, uh, and this picture is the rosier picture by May 2001. Slide, thanks, Paul. Uh, but there was, uh, in that year, some controversy regarding a, the chairperson uh, in relation to allegations of participation in rapes. So, uh, and there was some... Uh, the Howard government was having concerns about um, the, f the fiscal powers of, of ATSIC and where the money was going. So it began to pull back on those, and both parties um, um, of parliament, uh, the major parties, that is, uh, felt that ATSIC had not been successful. ATSIC is not a huge different, in terms of role, is not hugely different to the voice. However, um, the lesson probably learned that they, I don't think they'll be throwing the money at them that was thrown at ATSIC. Um, but regional and state sub-organisations were retained to give Indigenous people a voice in their own affairs. Thank you, Paul. Right, my personal experience. Um, OK, I'll stay with the script. An ability to agree... Oh, right, I've noticed a number of things. Um, uh, the interviews I did with elders, a lot of elders over a big distance, uh, indicated there was no consensus as to how they should be called. Uh, how our Australian Indigenous peoples should be called. Th I interviewed a senior, um, uh, an elder who's in government, state government, and um, uh, has a role in relation to records in the library. And she put me on notice that there was no consensus as to coming up with a trademark to put as, as we have the Australia-made trademark, a, a, an Indigenous trademark to show that this is an authentic um, work of, of uh, an Aboriginal person. So there was no consensus with that. Um, my concern is not so much with the voice, but an expectation that it may not be a united voice. Um, the second limb is discretionary, that is, may make recommendations, and I'd expect that there, there must be some consensus involved with that to give the government a position to say, well, this is what the voice's view is. That's the expectation of the draft legislation. It's, it's expecting a unified, unilateral recommendation. Um, the explanatory memorandum is a document, I don't know how many of you know about that, but it, it's, it's become more popular in the last 20 years to explain why certain things are in the Act. And the uh, EM, as, as we call it, 
Uh, a representation is a statement from the voice to parliament um, and, and that fortifies to me that it's expected that the, that the recommendation will be a unified uh, recommendation. Uh, the parliament may provide for the procedures. So again, may, the government is not obliged. Now, the role of a explanatory memorandum is not to take the place of legislation. You only go there if you need to get what the intention of parliament was when you can't get it from the words of the legislation. So that one reflects an intention that, that the government is not obliged to take the recommendations of the voice, subject to them being a unified representation. Thanks, Paul. Um, I've reproduced that because of, from the previous slide I was just saying, just to remind you that uh, the voice doesn't have to make a uh, representation. Uh, it's a discretion. Paul, thank you. My other concerns in relation to the referendum uh, and the perceptions of the result. Um, I've heard reports, and, and one from a senior barrister in, um, in Sydney, that if you don't vote in favour of the voice, you're a racist. Now, I may not, I haven't decided, I may not, but my reasons will not be because I'm a racist, but because I have certain concerns as to the effectiveness and utility of it. So, but, but there seems to be this, if you don't vote for it, then you are obviously, you know, not in favour of re their recognition. I certainly am. Um, but I, uh, I may have reasons other than the ones that are thrust. That's a concern I have, the way it's being represented in that way. Um, I've, heard, I've, I've relayed to you that criticism that the third limb is over and ended, but when I've looked at it and applied statutory principles, I don't think they have to make recommendations and the government doesn't have to accept them. Uh, another issue is what's the social fallout of this? If the referendum is unsuccessful, is that a stigma that basically um, Indigenous people say, well, we are, don't feel at home in, our, in this country? Is that going to be something? I think it's going to certainly be, be something that they, ex um, or, or elements of the Aboriginal people will say, we are treated as second class citizens and this referendum has shown it. Well, I mean, that's a reasonable, I'm not advocating it, I'm just saying that's a reasonable thing to, to, to do. Um, I'm convinced of the wealth of their learning. Uh, as I've done uh, many, um, jobs for Indigenous artists, I have, and particularly that paper that I wrote, I was convicted, um, I was convicted that I don't understand the artistic work, for example, let alone the literary work, but I don't understand it. It looks pretty, it looks interesting. I've got one in my office that I reluctantly bought because, not because I don't want to support that art, but I don't understand it. I don't know the depth of the meaning of the things that I'm looking at. I just think that they're interesting characters. I may be, you know, the, the artist normally puts some sort of an explanation on that, but, but it's beyond me because I haven't grown up in that situation and I don't know what that. So I have those reservations, but they have pharmaceutical companies courting them because Bush Medicine has come up with some things that the pharmaceutical uh, innovate and research and develop and come up with um, with pharmaceuticals that are used, sourced from bush medicine. One story was um, a, a particular uh, Aboriginal man uh, cut off his fingers and he was four days walk from from Melbourne and um, uh, when he arrived the his condition was as if the the injury had only just happened a few hours ago. There was no festering and they had used bush medicine along the way to apply to the wound, and the doctors just marvelled with it. Um, yes, I, um, there is an element I've noticed uh, uh, amongst the, um, and I'll be wrapping up now, uh, with um, Indigenous Australians, or Indigenous peoples, I suppose, the, the, for, the, for the elements that like, accept that terminology, the um, Indigenous peoples that say that um, um, 
we, uh, we should have a voice in relation to our works and our artistic works. And the way I accommodated that in the paper was to provide within the Copyright Act a specific chapter. There's a chapter on crown use, a chapter dedicated to um, uh, Indigenous cultural knowledge and its manifestation through literary works, artistic works, musical works um, uh, and uh, dramatic uh, works. So um, that was not satisfactory amongst a lot of the Indigenous people that I spoke to. They wanted a separate act. So even recognition within what I was trying to do was to embrace and reconcile and say this is the law that applies to copyright in Australia. There's a chapter that's dedicated and acknowledges Indigenous works, cultural knowledge. And we had to expand it a bit because the basis of copyright is that you, what I say um, is, is not copyrightable unless it's recorded or it, you know, it reduced to writing. Uh, but uh, there's a strong uh, voice, an element in the Aboriginal community that says, no, we want independent acknowledgement. I find that, without having a motive that why should they, I find that is more divisive than to embrace as an Australian community. There seems to be some an element uh, that wants independent recognition and will always want not to be associated with Australia. That's why when I saw that proclamation in 1995, the Australian Aboriginal flag. But I'm sure many don't want it to be called the Australian Aboriginal flag. They want it to be called the Aboriginal flag. And that, that is something that I'm not sure. But if it's a step in the right direction that they have an acknowledgement in the Constitution in that format, I myself, although I'm undecided as yet, I myself, and I've given you, I've shared what my concerns are, but I myself do not see um, what seems to be like just word and mouth um, fears about the effect of the voice. I don't see that it's something that uh, the government will have its hands tied to accept. And that's it. Any more, Paul? I think that's it. Ah, oh, now that is uh, that's instead of putting. A, I mean, I can't. I'm not very exciting. I do an exciting area of law. But I could have put the word questions, but I put that. And now the, the, the value of that for your own knowledge is this. I went and asked for a free, free example of someone who is concerned or stressed. Forget photographs, don't use those, because someone's taken the photo and that's copyright, even if they say it's free. But this is good chance was done by artificial intelligence. And in Australia at the moment, we don't recognise artificial intel intelligence as an author of that. So bring on your lawsuits. I do not care. Now, are there any questions that arise from that? <laughs> Tread carefully. No, 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 I was kidding, I was kidding.